can tell you a little bit uh, more about uh, my background and sort of what I do. Uh, so I'm currently a data scientist at Jumping Rivers, uh, where I do various things, mostly using R, uh, including statistical consultancy, uh, building shiny apps and running training courses in R, so teaching other people how to use R. Uh, my background is in uh, academia, specifically in statistics, um, and that's where I first started using R about eight or so years ago. And that's also where I first started to think about data visualization a little bit more. Uh, so I've been making plots of results for a while, uh, but then when I started working with really big data, you just can't visualize everything. So I started to think about how do you effectively visualize data. Um, and one of the elements that I've thought about quite a lot, especially when it comes to accessibility, is color. Um, and so today I'll talk about working with colors in ggplot2, uh, how to choose which colors to use, and then how to save yourself uh, some time by making your own functions. I want to keep the talks sort of quite short so that we have uh, time for discussion at the end. Uh, so I'll also link to some extra resources that you can uh, sort of follow up with in your own time. So first of all, if we're going to make some plots, we're going to need some data. Uh, I've chosen to work uh, the examples today with some data about lemurs, uh, and it's from one of the Tidy Tuesday data sets. Um, so the choice of this data set may or may not be influenced uh, by the fact I was at the zoo yesterday. Uh, so it's a simple subset of the data I'm going to be working with. Uh, so we have just two columns, uh, the names of some different species, um, and n, the number of lemurs uh, in that species. So if you're not super familiar with ggplot2, uh, there's essentially two main ways to work with color in ggplot2. So if we think about this example of a bar chart here, we could choose a single color for the bars, uh, sort of independently of the data like this, sort of specifying a fill color here. Or we could map a column in our data set to the color so that we, in this case, uh, get a different color for each level in that column, uh, in this case, species of lemur. Um, and I'm sure many of you will recognize uh, this plot as a sort of default ggplot to color palette. Personally, I'm not a big fan of it. Um, and from an accessibility point of view, it's not great either. Um, it's generally not colorblind friendly, particularly when you start using more than three colors here. Um, but I'll talk a little bit more about accessibility in a second. Um, so let's change to a nicer color palette. Uh, there are some built-in scale color or scale fill functions that change the colors you see. The scale brewer functions are pretty good, um, and there's colorblind friendly palettes in uh, those options as well. There's also a lot of additional packages that provide even more palettes, um, and many of those have scale functions that you can use directly with ggplot2 or base R if, if that's your thing. Um, I want to point out the Palleteer package here. Um, so this is an R package that essentially collates all the other R packages that have color palettes um, and sort of scale functions um, and sticks them in one package. Uh, so it's really useful if you just want to browse through uh, all of the potential options. But quite often, um, if you're working for a company who have their own color screens, or maybe you're writing your thesis, and you want to make all of your plots sort of match a university logo or something, you probably won't find the exact colors you're looking for in an existing palette package that someone else has made. And so what you can do is add your own colors with the scale manual functions. And you just pass in a vector of colors that you want to use, uh, either as hex codes, um, as I've done here, or as uh, RGB values or named colors. So we know how to add colors with ggplot2, but how do we know which colors we want to use? Well, if you think about named colors alone, uh, there's 657 named colors in R, and then you can take into account um, 
the sort of thousands of hex codes as well. It's a lot of choice um, and a lot of possible combinations of colors. So how do we choose them? Well, if you're really, really lucky, you have a marketing department in your company who has written down all of the hex codes for all of the colors you should use and in the order you should use them. If you're not so lucky, um, another option is to choose colors uh, thematically. Uh, so if uh, you're making a plot about, say, uh, fruit, um, you might want to use sort of a picture of a fruit basket and pick some colors out of that. Okay. Um, and there are some color picker tools for uh, sort of choosing uh, hex codes from images. Um, there's online tools uh, like the, the image color picker. Um, and there's also an R package that lets you do that directly from within RStudio, so the eyedropper package, uh, which is very useful. I won't go into too much detail here. Um, Cara did a talk last month, um, which was really useful um, and sort of covered choosing uh, colors based on your data set and what, you, what your data is trying to show. Um, so have a little look at her slides for a little bit more on thematically choosing colors. What I do want to talk about is accessibility. So once you've selected some possible colors, it's really important that you check if they're colorblind friendly. And there's a couple of R packages you can use to help with that. Uh, one of them is this colorblind check package. So you can pass in your vector of colors and you get this little report about your colors for different types of colorblindness. So here the column I usually look at first is this uh, NDCP column. So that's the number of distinct color pairs. And you can compare that to the value you see um, if you have full color vision. It's, it's obviously not a sort of perfect test is not going to be a sort of strict this palette passes or this palette fails. You still have to sort of um, look at how distinct the colors are uh, from each other. And it's usually easier to do that visually. Uh, so if you also set plot equals to true, you see what the colors look like with different types of color blindness, uh, which is quite useful. Now, if you want to visualize what a palette looks like with different types of color blindness, I would also recommend looking at the colorblind R package, which transforms how the colors look in your plot. And the nice thing about this, rather than just sort of plotting the palette itself, is that it also allows you to see what the contrast is like with the background color. Um, so that's especially important if you're not using a sort of standard white background. It also lets you see what the colors look like in monochrome. Um, and this is something I wish I'd known about earlier. Um, so here the, the three colors look okay-ish in terms of color blindness, uh, but in monochrome, the last two colors are pretty much indistinguishable. Um, and this can be a problem for journal publications. So reviewers or journals themselves uh, sometimes print articles they're reviewing or publishing in black and white. Um, so it's sort of an additional thing to check, um, and it's something that was sort of pointed out to me in some of my plots, um, that even though I'd picked colorblind friendly uh, colors, uh, they don't work when you printed them in black and white. So alongside um, these packages, there are some sort of general guidelines that are useful for helping to make colors accessible. So generally you want to minimize the number of colors you're using. It's much easier to find three distinct colors uh, than 12 distinct colors. You should also think about varying uh, the luminosity of the colors you picked, so the brightness of the colors. And this is one of the problems with the default ggplot2 colors. They're all equally bright. Okay? And this is also the thing that can uh, make printing them in black and white uh, more difficult as well. So if you're, as well as varying them in sort of hue and color, if the, the colors also vary in brightness, uh, it just makes them easier to tell apart. And of course, all of this applies to not just um, sort of plot elements like bars or points, but also things like checking the contrast of the text against the background. Um, and there's a few different sort of online tools you can use to check if uh, sort of text is dark enough to read against your background color. You can also check what your colors look like um, on different chart types. Uh, so this plot color package uh, lets you see what different colors look like in, say, a line chart, 
uh, versus a scatter plot versus a bar chart. Um, and you might find that some particular choices of colors look okay in like a map, but if they're in lines and the lines are thinner, it's harder to tell them apart. And actually, despite the fact that uh, this entire talk is about colors, the most helpful thing I think I could say is don't rely on color alone. Uh, human beings in general aren't always that great at interpreting colors. Um, and then when you add in uh, the accessibility issues, it's important to not just use color. So if you're making a scatter plot, uh, the point should also have different shapes if they have different colors. And if it's something like a bar chart, uh, there's a GG pattern package, which can add patterns, so dots or stripes or something, uh, to the bar charts, as well as the colors themselves. So let's assume that we've picked some colors, we've checked they're accessible, and we're ready to use them. We could pass our vector of colors straight into those scale manual functions I mentioned. But that means that if we're making multiple plots, uh, for example, for a presentation report or something, um, and you want all of your plots to be styled consistently, then you've got to copy and paste that scale manual code into all of your plots. And similarly, if anyone else wants to use it, if you work in a team in a company, you want other people's plots to be styled consistently as well. So again, it's, you just have to email that code back and forth and then copy and paste it. And in R, we don't really like copying and pasting, right? So Instead, we can make our own scale functions. So the first thing I'm going to do is store my colors in a list. This makes it easier if I want to have multiple palettes. So I might have a sort of sequential palette, um, and then I have a discrete palette here, for example. So here I've just gone for one, um, and I've called it my favorite colors. Then we need to somehow turn this list into a palette object. In the same way that when you use scale functions uh, with its sort of default colors in ggplot2, you'd never need to tell ggplot2 how many colors you need. It sort of automatically calculates it for you. So we didn't need to specify that we needed three colors to go with the three species of lemur, um, like we did with scale manual. The sort of default ggplot2 uh, functions know how to do that. I won't go through all of the codes. Um, for this sort of my palettes function here. It is available online if you want it. Um, but the important thing to point out here is that I have two different outputs. I have a discrete and I have a continuous palette. So this will either give me a sort of color gradient bar or a discrete legend. Okay. And we can check if it works. Okay. If we use this palettes function, uh, select the name of the my favorite colors palette, it gives me the vector of colors back. And now we can make our scale functions. So for discrete colors, these are just a wrapper around the scale manual functions. Okay. And I just put in the palettes function we just created to the values of colors. And here, uh, one important thing is sort of adding in uh, these ellipses here. Okay. And that means that you can use any arguments that you apply to the scale manual functions in your new custom scale functions as well. You, sort of, you inherit those arguments. So for example, uh, if you want to change the legend name or setting the limits of the scale, you can still do that automatically with this new uh, scale color my calls function here. Continuous scales have a very similar idea. So here, instead of wrapping around scale manual, we wrap around scale gradient n. So this function sort of interpolates uh, the n colors you pass in into a continuous uh, color bar. And we have the same thing with the ellipses here as well. So if you want to match uh, uh, sort of limits or uh, breakpoints in, in your scale, uh, you can do that as well. If you want to match ggplot2, uh, you can also make sure your functions work with either uh, the American or British spelling of the word color. You can just sort of uh, reassign uh, one function to the other. You don't need to copy and paste uh, two versions of it. So let's see an action. Just back to more lemurs. Okay. So this time uh, we're using our custom scale function. And we get the same plot as when we used scale manual. But here our work has less 
copying and pasting, it's easier to use. I don't need to specify that I needed. I don't need to manually count out the three colors. I can just use my function and ggplot2 does it automatically. And if we were to color by n, the number of lemurs, so a continuous variable instead, we could use our custom continuous scale. So here I've also changed the limits and the breakpoints in the color bar scale uh, to show you how those inherited arguments work. And we get our continuous uh, gradient here instead. So let's say you've done all of that. Uh, what, what do you do next? Okay. Um, one thing you might want to do is define a print method. Okay, so okay, I've linked to the uh, advanced R book here uh, that talks about S3 methods. Um, so when you're deciding which palette to use, it's usually easier if you can actually see the colors themselves rather than just getting this vector of hex codes um, because you don't really know what they look like if you just see the hex codes themselves. Um, so what you could do is you could create a print method so that when you run your sort of my palettes function, it prints the colors to the plot pane automatically and you can sort of visually compare them and decide which ones you want to use. The other thing that you might want to do once you've uh, made a print method is, well, we've just created a bunch of functions that we probably want to reuse either in our own work or we want to share them with other people. Um, for them to use the same uh, functions and palettes as, as I am. Um, and that's normally an indication that you want to bundle them up uh, into an R package. So you can store uh, the color pal palettes themselves, as well as these scale functions in an R package. And it makes it much easier for other people uh, in your department or in your team to use the same color scheme. Okay. And if you, uh, you could add it to GitHub or add it to CRAN, and it would be included in that Palettear package as well, so that you can, again, share it with uh, a sort of wider range of people if you want to. As well as uh, scale functions. Uh, so scale functions in ggplot2 work to control uh, the sort of elements that might be related to your data. So if you mapped a variable to your data, you use the scale functions to change how it looks. We also have ggplot2 themes. So theme, the theme function uh, changes all of the other elements. So things like the uh, fonts or the background colors um, or sort of the uh, line widths and things like that of the grids. And what you might want to do is create some theme functions to match your scale functions. So you can change the color of the fonts again to match um, any branding or sort of uh, color schemes or anything you might have. Uh, so that sort of brings me to the, the end of uh, uh, my talk about colors. Um, if you do want to use any of the sort of codes or resources in the slides, um, they are up on my website. I can post a link in the chat in a second. Uh, the source code for these slides is also on, on GitHub if, if you want that to use it directly. Um, but otherwise, uh, thank you very much for letting me talk. Um, I'm happy to take any questions.